Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, a toolkit for building an effective governance program sponsored today by Metric Insights. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to start highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note the Zoom default the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. And to find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Mike Smitherman and Marius Moscovici. Mike is the VP of Sales at Marketing at Metric Insights and has over 15 years of product and marketing experience in the business and intelligence industry. He helped bring analytic products to market with senior roles at Seagate Software, AIM Technology, T-Leaf, Xero, and Good Data. Marius has over 20 years of experience in analytics and data warehousing. Marius is the CEO of Metric Insights, the leading provider of a BI portal that helps organizations organize their BI environments and ensure users are getting the actual data they need. And with that, I will give the floor to Marius and Mike to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon. Um, I will just share my screen here and then we'll get going. And I will hand it over to Marius to start. Thank you, Mike, and welcome everyone. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, what makes up an effective BI governance program. And the, the presentation is really tailored towards you, know, you if you are either uh, taking this function on and trying to create BI governance within your organization, or perhaps you're inheriting uh, some existing governance um, uh, framework that's there and you're trying to sort of evolve it and make it more successful. And I should say kind of before we get started that, that you know, when we talk about BI governance, we're not just talking about data governance, but we're talking about data governance together with analytics governance, kind of as a holistic way to manage all of and govern all of the um, BI ecosystem that you have in your organization. Um, and I should also mention that you know we're, we're going to show you some specific examples. Some are kind of a, a examples of uh, documentation type things and surveys and things of that nature. Also show you some ways in which you can apply governance uh, using Metric Insights as an example. But really the, the important thing here is not the specific details. Um, it's not about uh, sort of using the perfect framework um, or taking a very pedantic approach, but rather it's about uh, being a very, um, uh, ju just practical in your approach, you know, being pragmatic in your approach. And, and what I would hope that you take away from here are the guiding principles uh, more so than any specific examples. So um, with that said, let's go and sort of talk about the, the, the building blocks or the key pieces that need to be in place in order to make uh, BI governance effective, right? So what are the, the steps at a high level as we see it? Right? So the first step, if you're, if you're starting maybe from clean slate or if you're doing a reset, is to build a business case for the governance. You know, and really this is all about you know, beginning with the end in mind and establishing for all the stakeholders within the organization, you know, what is it, what are the goals? You know, what are you trying to accomplish? And, and this is obviously a key first step. Then the next step is with those goals defined and, and, and we'll go into kind of how those goals should be as specific as possible and measurable as possible. And with those goals defined, then it's all about getting consensus within the organization. It's getting everybody on the same page so that all the key stakeholders are in agreement that uh, this is something that needs to be done and that they're going to apply resources towards making it happen because, you know, Governance is not a, something that can be wholly accomplished by any centralized governance team. It's always going to require collaboration uh, with both the BI team and the business within the organization. Then once you've got consensus, it's very important to define both long and short-term objectives. So you wanna know where you're going, the overall goals have targets that you're headed for, but you don't want to get lost uh, in the overall journey and not have sort of short, tangible goals that you can use to build upon and, and accomplish a progress. And we'll show you some examples later. You know, how, how does that work? How can you kind of, you know, segment your goals into, into phases and, and, have, and build on the successes as you move forward with that? 
Then, um, you know, to make this work, obviously, you need to be very clear about roles and responsibilities. So it's really important to define who is going to participate in each aspect of the governance process, what, who, create that racy matrix that, that uh, maps uh, the key roles to their responsibilities, particular functions that have to be accomplished. And th thereby, you know that you've actually got buy-in, not just at an abstract level, but at a very specific level when it comes to actually doing the work that makes government as possible. And then finally, and, and really just as important as everything else, is to manage and measure your success. You know, maybe measure your results, you compare against the baseline that you've established uh, when you, when, in your business case, and, and, you, and you see how you're doing and then you iterate right? because it's an iterative process. So you continue kind of in the cycle uh, to make sure you're successful until you are fully successful towards your goals. So let's look at each of these sort of key uh, steps in more detail, right? So let's talk about building the business case, right? Basically justifying, you know, why do I need to have a governance program and what it's going to accomplish, right? And, and I think here you really want to look at each the areas within your organization where you're going to generate measurable results and focus on those areas and identify goals in each of those areas. But in order to have a goal, you must first have a baseline. So you must first know, well, how am I doing in these areas? What are the key measures and how am I performing? How are we performing as an organization? So I've included in this presentation sort of four sort of typical measures around standards compliance, analytics usage, license utilization, and user feedback. And we'll go and give you some specific examples around those. But you would want to think in your case, you know, maybe all these apply, maybe some, and maybe there's a number of others that also apply, uh, depending upon what the objectives are of governance within your organization. So let, but let's take a look at an, an example. So standards compliance. So clearly this is one that would certainly be the case in every governance uh, initiative is that there is uh, a need, to, there are some standards that have been established within the organization uh, that are critical. And a lot of times these things have to do with uh, data security, a uh, protection of PII data, um, ensuring that uh, data sensitivity and classification it, it, things are, are addressed, but there may also be things around uh, uh, business terms and glossaries and definitions and, and other things as well. Um, and, and the point being is that what you want to do here is you want to say, well, we've established some goals. A lot, a lot, to what extent are these goals actually supported end to end in, my, in our organization? And that's a very key distinction. You're not just looking at the data. It's great if you've identified PII information in, in each of your data sources um, at the table level and you've cataloged that somewhere. But unless a consumer of that information is aware of the fact that they're working with PII data um, or they know what kind of sensitivity or classification applies to a given report and what that means in terms of how to handle that report, then that criteria of, uh, is not really satisfied. Right? So you can look at what are all the assets that you have out there and then you know, make an estimation or, or do an analysis to figure out you know, to what extent are we compliance with that particular criteria. Right? And so as you see examples here, uh, PII data, data sensitivity, uh, maybe constraints around how information should be used, whether that's policy or enforced within the particular technology, uh, to what extent are those set being satisfied? Uh, and then you know, things like uh, metadata attestation and certification, you know, are those, are those happening on a regular basis so that once metadata has been established, uh, you're able to go back and say, oh, uh, you know, this was, uh, this had a, a PI data six months ago, does this still contain PI data or, or vice versa? Or what is, has the data classification changed for this object? So all those things, uh, being able to handle that and with some kind of frequency through an attestation process um, on a regular basis, are all examples of these kinds of standards compliance type of use cases. And you, and you just basemark that, uh, baseline that, your overall compliance for that. Another area that's very common is around analytics usage. So here, um, if you think about governance, it's clearly must be much more than about security and classification and maintenance of metadata, right? Effective governance is, is essentially stewardship of resources in such a way that, that, that you're maximizing the value from the investment you put in those resources. And so, one way to measure that is to look at the analytics that you have and say, well, okay, how many reports are available to users? How, what have I made available to users? And at a high level, what percentage of those are actually actively used? 
So, you know, we have 500 reports, uh, uh, sales reports between Tableau and Power BI. How many within the last 60 days have had any usage at all, right? So if there's, if, the, if the, you know, and that number indicates to what extent your environment is a curated, you know, manicured, beautiful garden that, that is well governed and it allows people to, to consume content easily and to what extent it's not, right? And it's, so it's a very useful baseline. And oftentimes these numbers can help justify the business case for a moving forward and doing uh, investing in analytics if, if, the, if the percentages are not very high. Uh, another kind of slice of this is to look at uh, cost or ROI from a more of a license utilization perspective. So, you know, obviously from a, from a cost perspective, investment in BI is very, can be very high in an organization. And that investment spans both the tools themselves and of course the expensive resources that are working with those tools, building reports. And so if you measure and you say, well, I've got, you know, for, for Tableau, I've, I've licensed 500 users. But if I look at actually who's used the product at all during the last 60 days, you know, what is that number? And what is that number is the percentage of my licensed users? Then, and I look at overall costs that I have from my licensing, then I can identify what is my underutilization of that hard cost, that licensing cost. But more importantly, that percentage is an indication of also underutilization of the BI analysts that are building content, right? Because if I'm building content for a community and only 40% of that community is actually using that content at all, then clearly there is is a, a, a lack of efficiency or an underutilization of that significant investment that's going into both the licensing and into the resources that are using those tools to build out the, the, the content. So this is another sort of powerful justification from a business case perspective to identify uh, why um, having proper governance is very important. And then, you know, the last three we've looked at were all examples of, you know, very objective measures, right? You just go, you measure what's actually happening and you can report it. Uh, equally important in a, any kind of business case justification is having a subjective measure as well and understanding, you know, your user community, how do they perceive the value of the analytics that you're consuming and how, they put, how easy is it for them to consume the analytics? Do they understand? They have necessary data literacy coming into it. Um, and what is their overall satisfaction level? So here's an example of, of just a few types of questions that you can ask. Uh, maybe ask people to provide from one to five scale uh, to indicate, you know, are they, are they uh, uh, very satisfied? Are they not very satisfied? Well, how easy is it to use the current analytics? Um, well, how much trust do they have in the data? Uh, are, are the, are the, do they understand the analytics that they're looking at or things clearly defined? Uh, you know, what, what are things streamlined so they can find their content? Uh, how productive is the time they spend in the reporting system? Are they, are they just searching for things continuously? Or are they, is it easy for them to find the things that they need? Uh, and then just in addition to any sort of number of those kinds of very specific questions, um, we recommend that you always ask a one kind of high level question of their overall level of satisfaction. And I should say that this kind of information collection is very easy to perform, right? In a few minutes, you can create a, a survey monkey survey or use any number of surveying tools and, and, and then you know, send it out to people and collect it. The hard part here is really having the courage to generate this and send it out, right? You, you, oftentimes, uh, you know, the scores that come back are not particularly flattering. Uh, and, and sometimes they are dip, markedly different from what maybe people within the BI organization uh, or within you know, organization as a whole on the, on the BI side might think is, uh, uh, what, what is represents performance. So, you know, there's always the risk that your scores are going to come back a lot lower than you might think. Uh, but it is very important to take the step because, again, you cannot improve what you do not measure and understanding what it is where things are today, whether they be good or not, is, is critical so that you know what you're building from. So we've talked about, uh, we've done that, let's say we've created the business case. So now comes the, the next very important phase of the process, which is to say, let's take, we need to take that business case and we need to get consensus from the organization. And this is another area where sadly, oftentimes governance folks fall short, right? And the reason for that is, Oftentimes, those of us who are working uh, in the governance area are very passionate about data, we're passionate about visualization, uh, sometimes, well, oftentimes less passionate about getting a whole bunch of people into a room, arguing a case, getting consensus, right? That's a, that's a messy process 
Um, so it's much easier to go and you know uh, define definition business definitions and glossaries and, and and come up with processes for tracking PI data than it is to necessarily go in and, and get consensus. But this is really important uh, because if you don't do this, um, you're not going to be successful. As I said, it's not in any kind of large scale organization. It's never possible for just the governance team alone to be successful in deploying a solution. The other thing that is often uh, missing from these conversations and the kind of a, a, a common pitfall that you want to be thinking about is that you, you want to make sure that when you're engaging these various constituencies, you, you, you don't make the mistake of having uh, uh, not enough carrot and too much stick in your argument to them, right? What I mean by that is it's very easy to use the stick of compliance as a way to justify governance. Say, well, we have to do this because we must protect PII data, and we must, we must, you know, our team has told us that we must have these uh, key requirements met. You know, obviously, it's very important, and that should be part of the dialogue. But if you if you uh, have that conversation where it's too heavily weighted towards the, take, the stick, and there's not enough carrots, there's not enough goodies in the in the process for these people to get value themselves. What you'll see is they'll say, yes, yes, we agree. It's very important. Now you, governance team, you go do this because we have a whole bunch of other things. So we can't really do too much to support this. We agree conceptually that's required, but you go do it. And so there won't be the level of buying that's required for them to actually you know, allocate resources to actually to help you. Right? And so that's, so that's very important. So, so um, for example, for executives, you'll be looking at my, uh, compliance risks, but you know, you'll also be looking at maybe ROI. And, and how does the, what, what kind of BI systems are why I'll go back to those metrics that we baseline and identify ways in which you can generate better BI ROI from that. From the BI team perspective, uh, you'll be looking at, uh, you know, content, things like, hey, you're going to be boosting content engagement. Right, so you're building, you as a BI team are building all this content out there. If we put proper governance in place, a, a much larger number of people are gonna be using that on a regular basis. So that's gonna generate more value from you. Uh, you're gonna be generating higher utilization from your license. So when you go to talk to, your, to the CIO about, about your budget, it's gonna be much easier to justify what you have because you'll be able to show that, you know, that you've got high utilization numbers there. And you're gonna be saving a lot of time from your BI team, a well-governed environment, is a prerequisite for self-service. And if everyone is able to go in, consume their own content, they're gonna get fewer questions where you know, analysts are getting called up all the time to answer questions that can be addressed easily through existing reports that are there. If you're a business user, well, the value add to participate is you're gonna have a lot more trust in your information. A well-governed environment allows you to know which visualizations are certified, what, what contains, where the data comes from, uh, what are the key glossary terms that are, that are the key enterprise metrics that are referenced there. It gives you all that information to, to know that I can trust this visualization to make the business decision that I'm, I'm using it for. And, and so that general data literacy increases. So you're, you're, from a business perspective, I, as a, I know that my team is gonna go in and they're going to understand the data they're gonna make and properly interpret the information. And because I can self-service, I'm going to have time savings. I'm not going to be hunting around looking for content. I'm not going to be stumbling across content that is not useful. I'm going to be connected easily with the content that is relevant to me so that I can make the right business decision. So all of these are things that come out of the governance process that are the carrots that you want to focus to, in addition to, the, to obviously the fact that, hey, we got to do this in order to meet compliance. So um, the, the, Next step, if you've gotten the, the buy-in, then the next thing that to think about is the fact that you know you want to define both long and short-term objectives. So if you think about how uh, uh, you know if you have a little baby at home or something and you watch them kind of grow through that crawl, walk, run stage, right? It's it's clear that you know, they are really good at at getting incremental victories and building on those incremental victories, right? They iterate. They, they learn something, eventually they, they figure out how to do it. And then, you know, once they've gotten good at crawling, the next thing you know, they're, they're on their legs. And then once they start walking, it's pretty quickly that they start running. But they don't, they don't go from crawling to running, right? And so it's the same thing you want to do here. You want to treat this as a journey and, and say, and, and think about this as, a, you know, what are the goals that we want to accomplish right off the bat? And, when, and pick those goals in such a way that they're achievable. There are uh, things that you can do in during early stages of the process. 
and that uh, they allow you to act as a building block for the next set of goals and, and, and so on. And in doing so, then you can build momentum because if you try to do too much uh, all at once, typically you just can't get to the point where you generate value quickly enough and then you can easily lose momentum. So for this purpose, we're gonna, we're gonna take and, and give you some examples of this, of specific things you can do in phases. And we'll use the metric insights product as, as an, uh, you know, to, in order to illustrate these examples. But as you look at this, I want you to be thinking about more, rather than the specifics, it's more important to be thinking about, you know, what would be the right um, incremental steps in your organization in order to create value in this stepwise fashion. So with that said, I'm gonna switch over to Mike to show you the, uh, some examples. Yeah. Okay. Then the first step will be consolidated BI portal, which is a, a governance uh, platform. And it's the idea being that before you can govern everything, it must all exist under a single pane of glass where it can all be applied. Uh, same rules can be applied to everything. Yeah, thanks, Maris. So, so as Maris said, we'll take you through sort of some examples of kind of what this practically might you know, look like and what you might work towards in your organization. And I just switched across to uh, to the Metric Insights platform, which you should be seeing in the in my browser now. And really, you know, as Marius mentioned, kind of in order to to instrument governance, both BI and data within your organization, in a lot of organizations, you have this very sort of disparate environment where you know, oftentimes there's, there's multiple BI tools, there's oftentimes documents and spreadsheets out there, you know, there is no one place to go for BI. And, and all those tools have differing capabilities from a governance perspective, if they have any at all. And so it's important to think about creating sort of this consolidated space where both um, analysts or publishers of content can publish content in a governed way, and we'll talk about what that might look like. Um, but also, as, as Mary said, where your sort of business user stakeholder and the executive stakeholder can get value out of the governance steps that you're taking. And so an example might be like you're looking at here, this is the, the metric insights catalog um, where we're, we're connecting to all our BI sources, and again, that's everything from sort of the BI tools like Tableau or Power BI, whatever you might be using, but also, you know, it's important to bring in anything that needs governing like spreadsheets or, or PDFs or documents or presentations that you may create on, a, on an ongoing basis. Have a place where you can pull all that in and each of these tiles in the middle is is, is something that we've published into this catalog and we'll look how, the, how they get in there in a minute. But you know, the benefit of getting in here is that you can govern all these assets in a, in a consistent way. And so what does that look like if we take something like a, a Tableau workbook here? Well, it's, it's the ability to, to publish it in a way that again, um, benefits both both the analyst and the end user. So here, when I preview this tile, you know, obviously we're picking up sort of what the what the dashboard is called, any descriptions. We're also picking up things like you know when was this data last refreshed, so the user has some context about the sort of relevancy of the data. We're adding in things like ownership of the content, so we know who's accountable for it, both from a business and technical perspective. Um, it may be that you're thinking about that classification of your content down the bottom here. So if you've gone through in your business case or sort of saying, okay, we need to identify which assets contain PII data or what the classification of assets is, well, let's use that to also help educate the, the end user who might be um, accessing this particular report so they have some context around how to use it. So, you know, it's internal to the organization, but this one doesn't actually contain any PII data. And then obviously things like glossary terms. So if we're going through the process of, of defining our metrics and defining our KPIs and how they're calculated and what they mean, well, again, making sure that that doesn't exist in a vacuum within the governance team, but it's also being presented alongside the content to the end users so that they have the context of it. And so, you know, by pulling this all together, and again, we'll look at how this gets in here in a minute, you know, when a user um, ultimately comes to access a piece of content like this, this Tableau dashboard here, 
they're getting this context around um, the, 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 the asset that they're looking at. They're, they're you know, um, um, getting a level of data literacy around the asset. Um, and they, they have all the information they need, not just to, to analyze the data, but also understand the context behind it. And again, whether they're looking at you know, a, a dashboard from a BI tool or whether they're you know, accessing maybe a spreadsheet that's sitting out on a file store out there or a version of a spreadsheet, the, the experience should be the same to them and they should have that context. Um, it should also be an environment where um, they can search, they can use that, that context that you've added and the, that governance um, um, information that you've added to either again, as a BI analyst or an end user, be able to search through that catalog of content. So you know, this, this catalog should have search capabilities where if I search for something, it's looking through all that context that we've gathered through the publishing process to you know, make it easy for end users to find content, made, make it easy for business, uh, business analysts to be able to see what, what's out there already being created by different teams and, and make it easier to consume and find analytics rather than typically what happens today where you know, if as a business user, I'm interested in some data, but I don't you know, know there's a report out there, I pick up the phone to Marius and ask him to create me another version of it. And, you, you end up with this clutter and duplication and lack of trust and lack of clarity into what reports are actually being used. So being able to search through the catalog, find things easily, either, either as a publisher or, or as an end user is, is critical. And then finally on this step is, if we just go back to, um, to the, the sort of spreadsheet example I was looking at here, is by having sort of this centralized catalog, this centralized space, you can also start to enforce some of those governance policies that we spoke about right at the beginning of the business case. So if you are requiring, you know, that perhaps, um, you know, certain assets require um, users to understand certain usage policies and compliance policies around it, then let's make sure we're kind of tracking whether that is being, whether that's happening at the user level. So being able to communicate through the catalog when certain policies need to be enforced and understanding, you know, or requiring users to accept that they've read those policies and, and are complying with them gives you a way of, as we'll see in a minute, measuring compliance and, and improving that baseline that Marius spoke about. So, you know, the, the crawl step is, is to, figure out how you can pull together a governed space where you know you can have consistency around some of these processes that you're putting in place thank you mike and i think that, that you know that's that's very important right so you have to have a some mechanism to do that and and once you've established a baseline way in which that that governance um inf can be applied across all the assets um, whether, you know, irrespective of where, where how you source that information in, um, you're now uh, ready to kind of take a next step. And, and uh, that next step will be to say, well, now I've got the right content up there. Now, how do we, how do we kind of create workflows or mechanisms whereby, you know, you, maybe you've created that an example of a, a smaller use case where you've got everything fully governed and, and, and well established, but now you're ready to roll it out to the enterprise. And you want to be able to have a, a mechanism by which users can, a, a BI analysts can participate in the governance process. They can do their own publishing, make sure that only the right content gets up there. You know, you don't want to bring in every piece of clutter that might be out there in your in your BI tool environment, especially if your BI tool environment's been around for a while. There'll be a lot of clutter there. You want to have a a well-defined process by which only the right content gets brought in, uh, by which it gets certified, the right metadata gets associated with it. And then you want to have a mechanism by which you know that if when users are consuming it, the data quality is preserved, right? So uh, perhaps you might have already created some checks in your ETL processes that that uh, validate that, that, that there's some uh, fundamental quality in the data, or identify when there's data quality issues. You want to make sure that there's a way to communicate that in an automated fashion to all the constituencies that are using that and that and that uh, so that if there's an issue with the data there's transparency around that 
uh, and uh, you know, users know that today they, they can't look at that particular information. So Michael will show you some examples of how that works. Yeah, so what we're, what we're really talking about here is having this ability to um, um, instrument some sort of, of workflow process, as Marius said, within, within your organization um, to, to onboard um, new content or, or you know, enable distributed teams to, to onboard new content complying with, with the sort of governance processes that you put in place. And I think what's important with this piece is yeah, it, it's not governance um, workflow shouldn't be sort of a one size fits all for your content. Yeah, you know, as you think about the content that you're onboarding, you should think about what, what is the necessary level of governance that needs to happen um, for it to be in compliance without it being overkill, but also with, with there being enough there to, to meet the standards that you've put in place. So, so any sort of workflow that you put in place to publish content should be flexible enough to apply to the type of content that you're, you're publishing. And so what do we mean by workflow? Um, well, it's really sort of the checks and balances and the addition of any of that metadata that we were talking about and ultimately the certification of the content so that when it ends up in this centralized space that you've created for your content, when a user looks at it, they have that context that we were looking at before and they know that they can trust the data. So a workflow simply is a number of steps that you're going to push the content through where an owner sort of um, has ownership of that step. It could be, it goes to a developer first to review the content, make sure the, um, the, the data is, is accurate and, um, and, and quality. It could go to a, a business review where they're responsible for sort of tagging it with your, your glossary terms and your metadata terms. It could go through the governance team to make sure that you know, the compliance standards and announcements are being added. But ultimately, again, depending on the content and the level that it requires, it is going to go through one or more steps before ultimately you can say this content is, is certified and something that we, we have, have complied with and, and something that we're gonna put in the catalog. Um, and so you will set up these workflows and if I just move the Zoom window here, um, you will then basically assign content to those workflows and the individuals who are responsible for each of those stages. And so, you know, what you're looking at here is sort of a board where, you know, content as it gets created will get synchronized into a particular workflow. It will be assigned as part of the stage to a particular user or users who's responsible for it. It could be as simple as this, where it's kind of a one step process where maybe the analyst is responsible for coming in, reviewing the content maybe adding in tags or glossary terms, classifying the content like we looked at before, before ultimately sort of saving and certifying it into, into that final stage. Um, or it could be, again, you know, maybe it's some financial reporting that we're doing that's going more externally to the board or out to our investors. And it's, you know, something that we want a, a higher level of scrutiny on well, that may go through multiple stages, involve multiple stakeholders, um, um, adding the necessary context or reviewing the data um, before, again, it ultimately gets published into, into the catalog and, and into, uh, into that centralized governance space. Ultimately, though, again, at the necessary level so that as a user coming into that space, easily identify what content has been certified when that happened and who was ultimately accountable for that process. So think about sort of the workflows that might, might have to um, be in place for the different types of content that ultimately you have in your organization um, and apply content um, to those workflows with the necessary level of scrutiny. Um, the second piece Marius mentioned was the idea of sort of data quality. Um, and again, you might be doing some data quality within your ETL tools that, you know, is obviously probably notifying the, uh, the, the analysts or the, the data pipeline engineers when, when issues occur. 
Um, a lot of times companies will do some level of sort of data quality alerting on the analytics as well. So, you know, if we're loading uh, a Tableau dashboard with, with data every day, what's the typical level of, um, what's the typical volume of data that gets added into that, that dashboard? you know, track that if we see any sort of anomalies in, in that volume, it, it can be an indication that something has happened with, with the sort of final step of, of, of populating the dashboard. However, you might be doing it, tracking sort of the data quality issues is important, but equally important is communicating those issues, not just to the, the, the builders, but also to the end users of that content. So by having a governed space you can also include announcements around that and and things aren't going to be 100 percent accurate 100 percent of the time i think end users expect data quality issues um, where they get frustrated is when they don't know they're occurring and i'm looking at a dashboard there's issues with the data and, and i don't know that but i'm making decisions off of it and so those data quality checks should automatically sort of drive announcements like we have here at the top um, associated with any dashboards where those issues might be occurring. Because then as a user, I come into this. Yes, I see it's a certified piece of content and I should be able to trust it. But I also see that there were issues this morning and therefore, you know, I should step back and not waste my time trying to figure out what was going on um, with what I think is business results, but ultimately it was data quality issues. So publishing workflows to get content in now that you've, you've got your baseline and, and maintain that, that level of scrutiny and then communication around the quality of, of, the, of the content on an ongoing basis is, is critical. So, so if you've gotten that established and now you've got your content in place, um, you've got some data quality measures, you've got a process for publishing and decentralizing that publishing process so that the right folks are involved in that. Uh, you've implemented that. Now you're really ready for that kind of run phase. And here um, we're looking at things like discoverability. So you want to make sure that, you know, sure you've applied a security model to identify who should access the content. Uh, you know, oftentimes you'd, you'd inherit that from the BI tools. But what about making content discoverable for users so that they can find and request access to it. You know, that's a key aspect of a governed environment because, you know, what you don't want is somebody going in looking for something. Um, they can't find it because they've not been given access to that report and they incorrectly conclude that, well, that asset doesn't exist and they go build it, right? Or they go request that it be built. And so that, that creates a, a situation where duplicate contents uh, is, is created by design, right? And that's obviously the opposite of a governed environment. So discoverability is a key uh, capability that you need to have in your in your governance delivery. And then, of course, um, if you've gone through the trouble of bring putting all that metadata in through the publishing process, that's all well and good. But that will um, uh, decay over time, right? You, it, it was it was perfect as of the time that you released it. Uh, but then, sometime afterwards, maybe that metadata is no longer accurate. Maybe that report has been modified and and uh, a new column has been added and now it has a different kind of data classification and different level of sensitivity. So having that attestation process whereby um, you revisit and, and recertify and identify that yes, this report is still relevant. And in fact, from a business logic perspective and from a metadata perspective, all of the key metadata attributes are still accurate. That, that's very important. Um, and then uh, the third item that, that um, we've chosen kind of for this run phase is the feedback process. So, uh, you know, you've, you're getting that, those surveys that we talked about at the beginning for the macro level feedback, but it's very important for a governed environment to also get micro level feedback, to know that uh, of these reports that are out there, which are the ones that users really find useful and which are the ones they don't find useful. And if they don't find them useful, why not, right? And having that feedback and I'm it, it should create a loop that goes back to the folks that are creating that content and are able to, to then, you know, improve the content. Uh, so um, let's look at how some of that would work. Yeah, so, um, you know, discoverability. So, you know, as Marius said, it's, it's key that 
you know, once you, you have governed content going into the environment, people are, are able to easily find it and, and avoid things like duplicate content getting created. So what, what does that really mean? Well, in this governed space, this catalog that you're creating, you know, obviously you should enforce um, security and, and permissions and ensure that anyone accessing the catalog is, is you know, only seeing data that they have the, uh, the permissions to see. But we can utilize that metadata that we've um, captured as part of the publishing process that we put in place to enable sort of a, a discoverability um, scenario. So if, for example, I was coming into our, um, uh, our catalog and searching around you know, something like procurement data, maybe there's, there's some information I'm interested in there, or I'm looking to create an asset around procurement um, the, the, as, as an analyst. I wanna know what's out there already, regardless of whether I have access to it. And so if I search for content, there should be this ability to have discoverability enabled where I can see here that actually there is a procurement dashboard available out there I don't have access, so I can't see the data. It's blurred out. There's a padlock over it. But I can get that context that we were talking about. You know, so, okay, who owns this particular report? You know, what metrics does it contain? Um, you know, uh, any of the, the, you know, what classification is it? Does it contain PII data? All that information that we might have captured when this was published. I can see this asset is out there. It seems to be similar to what I was going to create. So maybe this is something that I could go and request access to from, from that owner and, and you know, ultimately obtain access to it. So discoverability should you know, help you, A, save time um, from a business user and an analyst perspective. So I'm not wasting my time you know, trying to create stuff that's, uh, that's out there already, but it should also help sort of ramp up engagement across the organization. You, know, you make a guess or a, an educated guess when you set permissions and security of who, who would be interested in these particular assets. But you know, letting people find them and, and make their own decisions helps drive engagement with that as well. So discoverability. Um, the second thing Marius mentioned is, is the concept of attestation and, and review. So you know, all BI sort of has a, has a shelf life, both in terms of the data, but also in terms probably of the, the metadata that you're adding to it. So if we think back to sort of the publishing workflows that we mentioned before, um, here was this example of sort of multiple stages that an asset might go through. Um, each of these workflows should really also contain this sort of review stage where Based on rules that you put in place, again, it's gonna be dependent on the type of content that you're creating. You may want to automatically um, and bring certain assets and reports back into the fold to get reviewed on a regular basis. So an example might be here, where you know, every month this workflow is gonna look at the published and certified content that we have that's more than 90 days old, say, and if it finds any reports, it's going to put them automatically back into that review stage and assign it to a user or a group of users. And any content that gets put back into that review, it should automatically notify that user that, that they have content for review in their queue. You know, maybe this is content that needs, you know, putting back into the workflow to, um, to update uh, um, categorization or, or any of the metadata. Maybe it just needs review in terms of the content. Maybe, maybe this, this um, um, attestation was triggered because something changed within the report and therefore we, we need to relook at it. But whatever the, the rules are within your organization, it should be part of that automation and that workflow so that we can, um, we can you know, um, keep track of it and, and have it trigger automatically. And then the final piece is being able to capture feedback. So we, we talked about sort of feedback at the, uh, um, at the beginning in terms of setting a baseline um, for your customer satisfaction, for your user satisfaction. Um, an advantage of sort of bringing everything into this governed space 
is on an ongoing basis, then you can start to capture that at the asset level. And so you know, your, your space should or your catalog should allow you to um, basically trigger feedback mechanisms at either the content level or, or as a whole, where you can start to um, gather more subjective type feedback from your users. Um, you know, it should trigger these to, to pop up similar to what you might see on a website on, on an ongoing basis without spamming your users. You should also you know, enable users to offer up feedback if, if they have anything. And it's capturing things like that rating that we spoke about in the business case and potentially any subjective feedback that users might have. Um, um, you know, why do we do that? Well, we can then look at that when content comes into, um, into our attestation process and our, our review process, I just edit this, say, Tableau tile here, I should be able to look at sort of the engagement that that content is getting, so the usage which we're trying to improve, but alongside any feedback or ratings that, that my users has given me, because then I can combine these two things together. I can say, okay, is this a bit of content that perhaps needs to be retired because it's kind of meta shelf life? Is it something we need to update and, and re-review? Or is it something that you know, is still relevant that should be remain, remain in the catalog in a certified state? Thank you, Mike. So we've talked about the, some of the phases here that could happen in the qual walk run. Um, I think the, the for fourth step um, is making sure that we drill down. We've obviously gotten that high level uh, appro uh, approval and, and uh, support from business overall and from IT and from the executives. But it's very important to drill that down into the roles and responsibilities that are going to be required to support your process. So um, those of you that are not familiar with the RACI matrix, the idea is that uh, you basically identify uh, either deliverable task or area of responsibility, and then you identify your roles across the top. Uh, and then for each item, you basically identify in the matrix, you say, you know, who is responsible to do that particular item, who is accountable, there should only ever be a single uh, party accountable. There may be multiple people responsible that are doing it. Um, who gets consulted as, as the process is performed and then who are, is, is informed uh, just to keep them in the loop. And you can really think about all the things that you've defined as key to your process. Uh, here, obviously, this, this work, you're working together based on what you have from a, what you've enabled from a tools perspective, what you've defined from a process perspective, uh, and you identify that into, into in that list. And then for each of those, uh, you map the roles that you have in your organization to that process. And if it's a centralized function where, you know, obviously the, where the development is all done in, in, in central fashion, then there are probably fewer roles. Uh, but in the, this is an example where you might have a business unit that does its own projects and has a content publishers and leads and they're working on it. There's a BI team or uh, one or more BI teams that are working on onboarding content and supporting those business units. Uh, there's maybe ETL teams that are working on uh, you know, uh, moving data, uh, defining data schemas, uh, moving data for ETL. Uh, there's leadership on both the business and the and the IT side, and you've really got to kind of figure out how all that works together. So, you know, for example, governance standards, um, the, the practice manager for all governance is accountable, uh, the leads for data and analytics governments, uh, governance are responsible, and then, you know, some of the leads are consulted and everyone else is informed as an example. And obviously I'm not gonna read you all this, this whole thing and the details are not so important here, except to note that you want to go through this process and you want to make sure that there's buy-in across the organization as to who's going to be contributing, whether it's on a consultative basis, it's a responsibility basis, um, and so forth. You want them to, be, to, to have buy-in on that so that you don't have a situation where you have a, a great process, but the people to execute it are not aligned with that process. Okay, so then the final step in the process, and this is really a recurring ongoing step, is to say now I've, I've introduced this governance practice, I've, I've defined uh, uh, specific steps, I've rolled those steps out. Throughout this entire pro process of rolling things out on, on a quarterly basis, um, certainly, if not more frequently, but certainly on a quarterly basis, I want to be looking at how are we doing. 
right? And um, so you really analyzing and saying across those four areas that I used for my business case, you know, what was the, what's, what was the, what's the current state? What's the goal? Where do we start from? Right. And, th and that will give us a, a great, a great sense of things. So you benchmarked in each of those areas, the high level compliance with governance standards, your, in, in this example, the usage and engagement, the, tool, the BI tool licensing, and your user satisfaction level. You probably have established as part of your business plan, some goals to say, well, you know, our goal is over the next year, over the next two years, we really want to move this from a 40% to a 90%, you know, as an example. Now, how are we doing six months in? How are we doing 12 months in? Right, so it's setting up that cadence for checking in on, on progress. You know, some of these things obviously you don't you can't check in all the time. You're not gonna want to survey people continuously. So some things might be less frequently than others, but usage you can certainly look at on a quarterly basis. Engagement you can certainly look at on a quarterly basis. And and based on these results, you know, you hold yourself accountable, and the organization should hold itself accountable to improving. So if you're not moving the needle, then uh, you know, going back to look to say, well, why not? Right and, and 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 digging deep and making adjustments because the reality is there is no sort of silver bullet here of like here's the you know uh, met the 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 methodology down to the nat's eyebrow and the process that you can follow and be assured that you're going to have success. You know each organization is different. There are going to be different challenges that you encounter. So to, the 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 capability to be successful relies on having a baseline, having a set of tools you're going to apply, and then having an iterative process where the you where you examine your progress towards those goals, and then make incremental adjustments until you hit that goal. All right, thanks, Marius. So I think that kind of brings us to uh, to the end here, Shannon. I, I don't know whether there's any questions out there that we we might want to look at in the last uh, last few minutes here, but I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you both for another fantastic presentation. As always, always love the presentations you guys give. Um, if you have questions for Marius and Mike, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of the of your Zoom there. Um, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session and anything else requested throughout here. So um, do you have a use case you can provide for ROI? Well, I mean, I think some of the examples that we provided there are, are, are I, I'm trying to think of how to, how to frame it. I mean, I think if you take the business case numbers there, you can plug them into an ROI just by looking at what your costs are, right? So, so if you take a look at that scenario, for example, I say, okay, I'm underutilizing my BI tools by X percent. And that, and that means that the BI tools and some percentage of my of my existing um, uh, BI resources spend is underutilized and therefore wasted. So if I can improve that utilization from 40% to 60%, that will represent an increased efficiency of a certain amount. So, so that you can absolutely do the ROI that way. It is not generally possible to do ROI as in like in the classic sense of like, we're gonna increase um, you know, uh, revenues by X percent because it's not a direct line, right? The, obviously, there's increased data literacy contributes in an indirect fashion to reducing costs uh, for the organization, for the business users that are using it or boosting revenue. But the, the way you can tangibly connect it to it is, the, is by looking at those other measures of usage, um, like both licensing and utilization level. And then identifying based on that, what what is moving those 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 items? What does that represent from an increased efficiency perspective? Yeah, I'd agree. I think it's we're probably all the same on this call, right? It's the age old problem of, you know, BI ROI is is challenging, right? Inherently, we all know that data should you know increase sales if we're looking at it properly, right? But it's mm -hmm. hard to make those those links. So I think, uh, yeah, as, as Marius said, it's looking at it from a what are we spending on BI um, and how much you know, um, engagement and utilization are we getting out of that is, is a good place to start. Now, there was a question that came in early on into the um, presentation. It says, can you define asset? Are those sy uh, systems or docs? Yeah, so when we talk about assets, it's really the sort of BI assets. So reports, dashboards, spreadsheets, documents, anything that sort of contains 
you know, information, if you like, that end users are consuming. And, and you should think about it holistically, right? I mean, you know, obviously it's our BI tools, but, you know, organize, you know, Excel is not going away. Mm -hmm. Spreadsheets are out there. So how do you get control of those in a, in a governed environment? You know, we create the sort of, you know, maybe quarterly board deck, which contains data, right? Well, we want to make sure that's governed in a similar way. So asset equals sort of any document or report that you know ultimately requires some governance around it yeah and it would require governance because it's shared right so obviously there's lots of docs and powerpoints and and things that are just kind of a um you know just people are just using for their own purpose or or if the sharing is done it's completely ad hoc these assets are all things that are shared on a regular basis like example a board deck a, a uh, financial report, a performance relative to, to, to budget, you know, that every month or every quarter or every some frequency that thing is being issued, that should be governed because it, it, it you know, uh, it, yeah, obviously. Go ahead. So do you think it's critical to have the data architect creating and maintaining the, or maintaining the subject domain conceptual logical model with business metadata, the building blocks of one enterprise data model and involving domain data stewards in the process and getting their sign off in order to quote unquote certify the metadata? Otherwise it seems the, B, the BI data catalog may be subject to a lot of ambiguity. Yeah, for sure. I would totally agree with that, especially, you know, in a central, in a enterprise scale environment, you don't want the, the, the conceptual logical model being defined by alone by a particular subject area domain um, expert because, you know, that, that's a, in a in particular line of business, because then you're going to miss key areas where there's overlap around that subject area with other areas of the business. So that absolutely needs to be one of those collaborative exercises. And it should be the, the kind of the, the data architect, uh, you know, who's, who's a central centralized function, part of the COE, who, who should be leading the charge and working on that. And I think from a, you know, from a technology perspective, if you're implementing te technology to support this process, then, you know, you, you should leverage wherever that's happening, right? So yeah, you don't want um, ambiguity between your BI and your data catalog. So if you're defining stuff in the data catalog that's relevant to the BI catalog, it should flow through, right? I shouldn't have to replicate the capture of those definitions or whatever in, in a second area. So all, all this ultimately needs to work together in, in an enterprise environment. Love it. All right. I think we have time for one more question here. So how do you get the balance right for a publishing workflow? If it's too bureaucratic, then people might just might just publish in their silo instead of centrally. How do you get buy-in for having or not having too many compliance stages of publication? Yeah, I think that's really the sort of critical piece on this, right? That it, it shouldn't be, as I said before, a, a one-size-fits-all because I think that's a trap people fall into. Either they define sort of this single governance process that is too sort of heavy handed and therefore no one ever actually uses it or it's you know, not enough and therefore it doesn't really add any value to the process. So it's kind of a, a big discussion in its own right, but I think you need to look at the at a particular piece of content and, and understand sort of the impact that that is having or could have on the organization. So think about things like the, you know, the, the, the importance of the data that that particular as, uh, report contains. Think about sort of the scope, how many users are gonna be using that particular report you know, how critical is the data in terms of, you know, is it again a financial report that is going to be seen widely within and outside of the organization? Or is it just a, you know, a, a report that Marius and I are using internally within our team here? Um, and that should ultimately dictate the level of, of workflow that's required. And, you know, if you get that right, then I think there's this Again, if you think about the value and the messaging to each of the, the stakeholders, if you get that right, then you know, the appropriate level of governance, um, you know, users should want to comply with that because as a BI analyst, I'm going to know doing that will mean that my asset is getting used and trusted. You know, as a consumer, I'm willing to chip in you know, my, my um, review in terms of the business process because I know I'm not going to get in trouble if it goes out beyond the organization, the data is going to be correct, all those sort of things. So, yeah, again, tying the, 
the, the, the report to the level of scrutiny is important and not trying to do a one size fits all. Yeah, and, and I would add to that also think about that process, look at how whatever technology you're using for this, make sure it is a light touch for everybody who's involved. So like Mike said, it could be many parties involved because of the requirement, but for each of those parties, it should be really easy. So that means bring in metadata if it exists in other places automatically from source systems, if you know if it's in a spreadsheet or if it's in a if it's a, in the BI tool, and then make sure the process is minimal number of clicks. Uh, you know, the users are notified when there's something they need to do, and that, and that it's, it's, it appears, feels super lightweight to them, even if it's comprehensive behind the scenes. Well, again, thank you both so much for another fantastic webinar. Really appreciate it. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Always great to uh, see you all online. Uh, and just a reminder, again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. So thank you all. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Marius. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thanks, everyone. Hey.